My name is Robert Benz. Thank you for having us here. Thank you for inviting us. Uh, thank you to your father for giving you that rich uh, education of uh, those books. Uh, those are some of the greatest American books that uh, we've read. Um, and they give us so much to think about, so much to talk about, and we have built our, the last 10 years of our lives around these very topics. Uh, especially when you, uh, when you mention the book, uh, The White right Response to Black Emancipation. Um, this is really why we're doing what we do today. And, and uh, uh, Joe had mentioned that we're modern day abolitionists. Uh, one could argue if that word really means anything, uh, related to contemporary slavery. Slavery has been abolished. Um, so what are we and what are we trying to do? What we're trying to do is more or less the same thing uh, that the, uh, the 19th century abolitionists were trying to do. We're trying to stop <coughs> contemporary slavery. It's already against the law, but it's still happening and we have to ask ourselves why. And when we started doing this in 2007, we asked ourselves that question. And um, we thought that the reason we're in a place today where there are millions of people that are enslaved uh, to major forms of contemporary slavery are sex trafficking and labor trafficking. Um, and we believe that the reason slavery exists today is because there, after the, um, after emancipation, after 1865, the radical Republicans who said, we have to dismantle the institution of slavery after the Civil War is over, their flame was sort of extinguished after the, after the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, still, Reconstruction continued, but there were uh, losses to the to the idea of of, uh, of dismantling the institution of slavery, especially when it came to dismantling racism, um, systemic racism, which helps prop up slavery, help justify slavery. If we said, um, "Don't worry," this uh, man is not like us. It's okay if he's enslaved or she's enslaved. Or uh, uh, this man of African descent is meant to be enslaved. Or um, they are animals. Science tells us that they're different from us. Don't worry. When we stopped talking about that, when we stopped talking about, uh, when we stopped, stopped telling the truth uh, about those lies, um, and when I grew up, the history of slavery in the United States took about a page or two, maybe a chapter in the history that I read. Um, that's not understanding slavery. That's not understanding why it existed, um, who started it, what is racism, how did it help support the institution of slavery. That, that vacuum of knowledge that we all still live with was filled quickly by other people that took advantage of the fact that we knew nothing about why slavery exists. All we knew is that Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves, and slavery is a part of our past. So if we're not thinking that it could possibly happen again, it gives an opportunity to those people who would like to exploit others for profit, um, an opportunity to, to work, to, um, uh, to create a trade that uh, we, we all know is disgusting. And, um, so, when we started doing this in 2007, we decided what we would do because of his connections 
to Frederick Douglass and to Booker T. Washington that obviously we should be educating people about this issue of human trafficking because most people didn't know what it was. It came out of the blue. It was like an asteroid. Uh, the asteroid of human trafficking. It's, it's terrible and it's coming. Um, but we don't know what it is, even though it existed for 250 years in the United States and in and, and other places. How was it such a big surprise? It was a big surprise because we didn't learn about it in school. And we still don't learn about it. The way how many people associate, associate contemporary slavery and human trafficking with the movie Taken? How, how many people understood it in that, in that frame? Yeah, we all did. I mean, it was hard to avoid because it was so popular. But the way we understand it then is that a, there, there would be a damsel in distress. It happened to be this guy's daughter. Uh, he happened to be a tough white guy. And he was going to rescue the damsel in distress. Uh, he was a white knight rescuing the damsel in distress, who, of course, was taken by a bad person overseas. What this does is it totally ignores the fact that this is happening in front of us in our own communities. And it ignores the fact that we can, we can be agents of change ourselves. It doesn't take a guy who's strong with a gun uh, to, to change this for us. But this is exactly the way we've been addressing human trafficking for the last 17 years since the, um, since the passage of the Trafficking Victims Protection Act in the year 2000. We've been addressing human trafficking by saying to, to law enforcement, you guys take care of this. Don't tell us about it. Just you guys do it, and hopefully you'll get it taken care of, and, and we won't have to think about it. That's not the way to affect change. We really believe that in order to defeat human trafficking, to defeat slavery, we cannot have a response to it that says we either ignore it, we defy it, we say it doesn't really exist like you say it does. We have to be proactive. We have to educate young people about this issue, modern day slavery, because they're the ones being exploited. They're the ones being taken. They're the ones being abused. And so what we do, the Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives, which was started by Ken's mother, Ken, and myself in, in the year 2007, is we bring prevention education into schools. We want young people to understand why this exists, what existed before this, and what slavery was about, and how it really did exploit people who were like us in every way except for their skin tone and where they came from. And, um, and so it tells us that people can be exploited who are like us in every way and maybe have our exact same skin tone today. And that there's something that we can do about it and there's something that we have to do. So, in other words, we're leveraging history to help change the present and the future. And on that, I'll introduce you to the great, great grandson of Booker T. Washington and the great, great, great grandson of Frederick Douglass, Kenneth E. Morris Street. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Appreciate that. Thank you for that introduction. It's an honor to be here with the Sinistead family tonight. Um, thank you for that um, introduction and story. And to think that the two books that your father recommended that you read, number one, the narrative of my great ancestor, Frederick Douglass, and then the other one, 
the up, up from slavery of my other great ancestor, Booker T. Washington. And then my favorite autobiography is Malcolm X. <laughs> also, I'd like to thank Joe for the introduction and for the um, delicious dinner this evening. <laughs> and Dr. Nishiyama for inviting us to be here. And, and thank you all for coming. It's an honor to be here to talk about my family, to talk about this incredible lineage and this blood that flows through my veins, and then to also talk about our project, One Million Abolitionists. Next year is Frederick Douglass' Bicentennial, and we have published a special edition of the narrative, and it is our intention to give away one million copies by the end of 2018. Now that's a pretty big goal, we understand that, and it's something that we can't do on our own. So I hope that by the time we leave this evening, each and every one of you will be inspired to want to uh, participate in the project and use your talent, your passion, and your intellect to help us bring this book to one million young people around the country. I've been a descendant of Frederick Douglass my whole life. And I've had people come up to me, I remember being a little boy, and I know it sounds funny. I remember being a little boy and having old ladies come up to me and pinch my cheeks and pat me on the head. And sometimes they would have tears in their eyes. And it was always hard for me to imagine the emotional connection that so many had to my ancestors. And it wasn't until much later when I was talking to my mother, who um, she had shared with me that she, there had been times in her life where she also felt like she was almost this um, animal in a cage just being looked at and patted on the head and, and cheeks being pinched. And she was at an event and this lady came up to her again with tears in her eyes and she explained it so eloquently. She said to my mom that I read the narrative, I read Up From Slavery, and your ancestors, their examples of courage, and heroism, and overcoming obstacles to rise up, to go on to affect change in the lives of millions of people, inspired me to do what I'm doing, inspired me to be the leader that I am in my community, in my church. And if I could say thank you to your ancestors, I would. But since I can't, then you become the conduit to saying thank you to them. So now that I have that perspective, I actually embrace that when people come up to me crying and, and wanting to kiss me on the cheek and, and pat me on the head. Now, as I was introduced this evening, I think I heard it said a few times that I'm the great, great, great grandson of abolitionist Frederick Douglass, that's three greats, and the great, great grandson of the great educator Booker T. Washington, that's five greats in total. That's a whole lot of greats. And every time I tell people what my relationship is to my ancestors, not only is it a mouthful trying to spit out all of those greats, but it sometimes makes me feel like I'm very far removed. And you may be sitting there having a hard time trying to imagine what my connection is to Douglas and Washington. It's like trying to picture what a billion dollars looks like with all of those zeros. But I bet just about everybody in here knows or knew a grandparent. Some of you may have known a great grandparent. We spend a lot of time with young kids, and I've come into contact with kids that know a great, great grandparent. Well, that's how close I feel to my ancestors. Because you see, my great grandmother, Fanny Douglas, to whom I was very close, she lived to be 103 years old. And she met Frederick Douglass when she was a little girl. Now, she didn't know that she was going to grow up and marry his grandson, but that's what happened. And my Aunt Portia, to whom I was also very close, she lived to be 95. And she was Booker T. Washington's daughter. And I remember being a little boy and sitting on my great grandmother, Fanny Douglas's lap. And she would tell me what it was like to know. She would call him the man with the great big white hair. <laughs> and I remember sitting on my Aunt Portia's lap, and she would tell me firsthand stories about her father. And a few years ago, when Robert and I were talking to a group of students, and we were trying to wrap our minds around the distance between the generations, and when I introduced myself to all of those greats, the students were looking at me cross-eyed like, man, you are so far removed. What does this have to do with my life today? 
And I had this thought that hands that actually touched the great Frederick Douglass and hands that touched the great Booker T. Washington also touched mine. So in a sense, I can say even with all of those greats, I stand one person away from history. And I stand one person away from slavery. We're not that far removed from the legacy of slavery in this country. This country is the product of, sl this, of slavery. And this country is also the product of the abolition of slavery. So what I hope to do this evening is to inspire you with the stories of my ancestors. There were two men that were born into slavery. They were born into the most horrific conditions that a human being could be subjected to. But yet through the power of education. Now Frederick Douglass never spent one day of his life in the classroom. Because, as we know, it was illegal to teach an enslaved person how to read and write. And they would see him later in life with his great big white hair when he was the first African-American nominated, nominated vice president of the United States, the first African-American ambassador and council general to Haiti, the first African-American U.S. marshal, the first African-American recorder of deeds in the District of Columbia, and the list goes on and on, the first African-American to get a statue dedicated in his honor which happens to be the statue in Rochester, which was dedicated in 1899, four years after he passed away. And so they would ask, ask him, Frederick, where did you go to school? Where did you get your education? And he would respond by saying, my degree is written on my back. Both of my ancestors understood that education equals freedom, and it would be their pathway to freedom. So we're going to start with that as the foundation, because that's the foundation of everything that we do in our organization, as Bob mentioned in the opening, to raise awareness about this issue of human trafficking and modern-day slavery, and that slavery still exists. It didn't end with the work of Frederick Douglass and the abolitionists of the, or the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation, but slavery still exists in every civilized and uncivilized country around the world, including right here in the United States. So we use education as a vehicle to be able to help prevent this. And I'll talk a little bit more in detail about that in just a minute. Before I jump into the nuts and bolts of what we do, I, I want to just mention, because people usually ask me for the first time, two questions I usually get. First question is, so you're related to Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington? Well, what do you do? And they always follow that up with, and it better be good. <laughs> so as you can imagine, there has sometimes been in my life a little bit of pressure trying to carry around this legacy and this weight on my shoulders. The other question that I get is, well, wait a minute, I'm trying to figure this out. Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington were not related to each other. So how is it you're related to both of them? Anybody wondering that? Well, it happened on my mom's side of the family. My grandfather, my mom's dad, was Frederick Douglass III, and he was Frederick Douglass' great-grandson. And my grandmother, Nettie Hancock Washington, my mother's mother, was Booker T. Washington's granddaughter. My grandparents met in 1941 at Tuskegee Institute, which is the school that Booker T. Washington founded in 1881, and they happened to be on campus the same day, which kind of was amazing because my, my grandmother was living in California at the time. She had been born at Tuskegee. She was home for the summer. And my grandfather, who was a surgeon, had been commissioned down to the campus by the Veterans Administration during World War II. So they just happened to be on campus the same day, and they were rushing across to get to the other side, literally bumped into each other. Didn't know that the other descended from a historic family, and they fell in love at first sight and wound up getting married three months later. Clap <laughs> me for that. Yeah. <laughs> now, I must say, now that you started that applause, that as the father of two daughters, I don't recommend that. <laughs> but that's what happened. And then when my mother was born, Eddie Washington Douglas, and my mother lives in Atlanta. She, I was about to tell her age, but I realized it's being recorded, so I won't do that. 
I figured I could deny it, but if it's on the camera. She's in Atlanta, and she's in great health and very active. She is the person that united the bloodlines of the families. And then when I came along, I, 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 she was an only child, so I was the first male to unite the bloodlines of the families. So that's how the two families came together. So Frederick Douglass was born as Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey. He was born on the eastern shore of Maryland to a black woman who was enslaved and to a white man, and it was presumed that his master was his father. He never had a pair of pants or shoes until he was about eight years old. He used to sleep head first in an old corn sack with his feet hanging out on cold winter nights on a damp dirt floor because that was the only way that he could keep himself warm, try and keep himself warm. He only saw his mother four times his whole life. And that's because she lived on a plantation that was 12 miles away. So in order for her to see her son, she would have to work in the fields picking cotton from sun up to sundown, and then she would walk 12 miles in the middle of the night to spend just a few moments with him. And he was about a year old at the time, and she would stay with him until he would fall asleep. And then she would walk 12 miles back so that she could be back on the plantation by the time the sun came up, because if she wasn't, she was most likely going to have to endure a brutal whipping. So here was a boy who had been separated from his mother, didn't know who his father was. His brothers and sisters were like strangers to him because the nature of slavery was to separate families, certainly on this plantation. And so you had a boy who had no family, he had no home, and he had no country. But in spite of all of that, he was able to rise up, to go on and effect change. And had he not done that, we would be a very different country today in many ways. But what he did have at that time was his grandmother. And his grandmother's job on the plantation was to raise the slave children until they were old enough to really begin their life in manual labor. And on this plantation, that was around five years old. And so his grandmother was, showed him some love and nurturing early on. But when he was around five, she said, Frederick, we're going to go on a long journey. And that journey was a 20-mile walk to the main plantation, to the White House plantation, where she would drop him off. And she had done this many times before, so she knew what to expect. So can you imagine this little boy who's probably clinging to his grandmother's skirt, She's carrying him much of the way when his legs can't carry himself. And he didn't write about this moment in time. And I've always wondered what the conversation would have been between the two of them with, again, his grandmother knowing what's about to happen and him with the uncertainty of where they're going. And I always imagined that there was a lot of crying and, and clinging to each other. And then when we were talking to a group of students when we were first getting started, and I was telling that story, there was a young girl that raised her hand. She said, Mr. Morris, my grandmother is a strong person. And I know grandmothers are strong. And I bet you she said something to him in that last moment that would make him believe that he was not meant to be a slave for life. And that he would, could go on and do great things. Now, we don't know if that happened, but because his blood flows through my veins, I'm going to think that that's what happened. Because how, how can you explain it? How can you explain that he goes on to do the things that he did? So she drops him off, and he runs off to check out his surroundings. And when he turns, his grandmother is gone. And now he's truly alone. But he did have something happen in his life that he called divine providence in his favor. History is important for a lot of reasons. I like to think history is most important because we need to know where we've come from in order to know where we're headed. And we're making history every day, today. We're making history tonight for what's going to happen when we leave this room and the conversations that we have during the Q&A and hopefully the inspiration that you all will take away from this room. And so every moment in time counts. And I want you to listen closely to the story, because had this story not happened, again, we may be a very different country today. And that was on the plantation. He was chosen from among all of the enslaved children. And this was a big plantation. There were about 300 
slaves on his plantation. He was chosen from among all of the kids to go to Baltimore to be the house servant for his master's brother, Hewal, his master's brother-in-law, Hewal. Now, the importance of this move was he was leaving an environment where he couldn't learn how to read and write, and, but he was going to the big city where he would be around poor white children and he would be around three black children that knew how to read and write. What happened most importantly when he got there, his slave mistress, Sophia, had never had a slave before. And she didn't know that it was illegal to teach him to read and write. She was just a kind lady that saw this bright little boy, and she begins to teach young Frederick his ABCs. But when his master finds out about it, he gets angry, and he forbade it. And he looked at his wife, and he looked at Frederick, and he said, you cannot teach a slave how to read and write because if you do, it will unfit him to be a slave. I see some head shaking. You all heard that message. It will unfit him to be a slave. And he looked at his master and he said, hmm, if you don't want me to have this, I'm going to do everything in my power to gain it. And he understood right then and there that knowledge is power and that, again, education would be his key to freedom, his pathway to freedom. So he set off to teach himself to read and write. And he was very clever in the way he went about that. He would pick up a stick off the ground, and he would draw an S. And he would say, Susie, is this how you, you write an S? And she would take the stick away and say, no, Freddie D, this is how you write an S. And then he would file it away. He would also carry with him bread for reading lessons. He would trade the bread. In his narrative, the first autobiography published in 1845, which many of you will be walking away with a, a copy tonight. He wrote that he was always so hungry as a slave child that he had this pit of hunger in his stomach that would never go away. And on occasion, when he would get food, the overseer would take cornmeal mush and throw it into a pig trough. And all of the children would crawl on their hands and knees as fast as they could to try to eat what little food was in there, to eat like pigs to eat like animals, because that's what he was considered. He was property. He did not own himself. He was not no better than the sheep and the cattle and the horses. So if you jump back to the story that I just told about trading bread for reading lessons, what does that say to a young person or to all of us about the value of reading and writing, that he would trade something of such great importance, of great value to him? Food, it means that he would rather feed his mind than have his stomach go empty. And that's a great message for our young people. It's a message that they'll take away with this One Million Abolitionist Project. And it's a message I see resonate with them every single day. And this project is about literacy, it's also about social service, and it's about activism. And so Frederick starts getting to the business of unfitting himself to be enslaved. And so he would start to ask questions and think critically about his condition of enslavement and oppression. And he would say, well, why am I a slave? And why do you own me? And why can't I do the things that I want to do? And then he would turn to God and he would say, God, do you mean for me to be a slave my whole life? Because my master puts on a suit every Sunday and he goes to church and at church, he finds justification in the Bible to come back and to brutalize and dehumanize and exploit and rape and pillage and plunder his property. So, God, that doesn't match up with what I know is the pure, peaceful Christianity of Christ versus the slave-holding religion. So he worked on that later. As an eight-year-old boy, he wasn't thinking that. But he was asking the simple question, do you mean for me to be a slave for life? And as he read the Bible, he found out that no, God did not intend for him to be a slave, and that God loved him. So he's working to unfit himself to be enslaved. By the time he gets to be 16 years old, and he's big, he's strong, he eventually said to be that he was between 6'2 and 6'4. So he was a big young man. And he was unruly. He was unfit. And they couldn't break him. They couldn't get him to get in to behave. So he was sent to a slave breaker by the name of Edward Covey. And Covey had a reputation for breaking slaves. That's what he did. 
And so Douglas was hired out to work for a company for a full year. And he began to whoop Frederick. And he whooped him so bad that the welts on his back wouldn't have a chance to heal. And again, when he was writing his autobiography to describe how brutal slavery was to him, especially at that time, was he said, I could take the pen with which I'm writing these words, putting these words to paper, and I can rest it within the cracks and fissures of my feet that have never closed shut. And so Covey would whip him. And after six months of taking these brutal beatings, Douglas finally had enough. And he decided to fight back and to strike his own blow for his own liberation. And Covey and Frederick had an epic two-hour battle, which was more of a wrestling match, because he understood that he needed to be strategic in how he was going to defeat Covey, because if he were to hurt him or kill him, then he might have faced the same fate. So after two hours, Covey finally gave up. And if you could just imagine Douglas standing over this man who had been beaten, and he's breathing heavily and he's sweating, and Frederick looked at him and he said, you have seen how a boy has been made a slave, now you've seen how a slave has been made a man. And at that point, he knew that he was one day, he was going to escape from slavery. And he made his first attempt when he was 18. His plan was uncovered, and he was thrown in jail in Easton, Maryland, in the courthouse, which is still there, and there happens to be a statue of Frederick Douglass in front of the courthouse now. But he was thrown in jail, and then in 1838, on September 3rd, at the age of 20 years old, he disguised himself as a sailor, and he carried with him some free papers, and with the help of my great-great-great-grandmother, Anna, who sold a feather bed to help finance his escape, he would go by train, and then by boat, and eventually end up in New York City, call for Anna, they would get married, and then with the help of the Underground Railroad, they would make their way through that network up to New Bedford, Massachusetts, where he would settle in, he and Anna would settle in. When he was living in Baltimore, he was a ship copper, so he had this skill. And when he got to New Bedford, he could have just said, Anna, I love you, let's start a family, I can go and I can work on the ship docks, which he did for a couple of years. But he looked back and he saw that there was this state-sanctioned legal institution of slavery that needed to get dismantled. And so he found himself at an anti-slavery meeting with the white abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison. And Garrison heard that there was this fugitive slave in the audience, and he asked Frederick, will you stand up, will you just tell the audience your story? What was it like to be enslaved? And he said that he was so nervous the first time that he spoke, he was shaking from every limb and his knees were knocking together. Can you imagine this great order, great American order, how nervous he was? But he stands up, and what he had was he had a natural gift for communication. He was eloquent. He was charismatic. He was theatrical. He was funny. And so the importance of what he did at that time was the first time that the public was hearing from somebody who had experienced slavery that could communicate it in a way that nobody before him ever did. So if you think about what was being set out into the public consciousness, those that were pro-slavery, the federal government, they were saying, these are savages from Africa. They can't take care of themselves. They're better off in slavery. At least they're getting some level of care. They're getting some food, some a little bit of food. They can't take care of themselves. They're not worthy of freedom and citizenship. And then you have this good-looking man stand up, and he tells the world, what it was like to be a slave. And it changes, <coughs> because it changed public consciousness. And people can't wrap their minds around what they're hearing because what they're looking at and what they've been taught, they're not lining up. So as Douglas continues to speak, he goes with Garrison and the Garrisonians and from town to town and tells a story. People start to doubt he had been a slave. They said, well, look at him. Look at the way he speaks. Look at the way he carries himself. It's impossible. He's a fraud. So in order to prove that he had been enslaved, he wrote that narrative. And in it, he named names and he named places. Well, now he had another problem. And that was it became a bestseller. <laughs> and that's the last thing that you want, is the notoriety of a best-selling book and the celebrity that came from that if you're trying to run and hide from your master. 
So it was recommended that he go off to Europe for a couple of years for a pulling off period. And while he was in Europe, his abolitionist friends pooled their money together and purchased his freedom from his master for $711. And he returned to the United States and really began his work. He became an advisor to President Lincoln and all of the things that I mentioned when we started. And I'm just going to share a little bit about Booker T. Washington's story so that we can build that foundation and then we're going to jump off and start talking about the project and a little bit more about the work that we do around uh, prevention and education of child sex trafficking and child labor trafficking. So Booker T. Washington benefited from the work of Douglas and the abolitionists, and he was free when the Emancipation Proclamation was signed. He was nine years old. He wanted to go to school so badly that he worked in the salt and coal mines of West Virginia at night so that he could begin his lessons during the day. And so he would work every night and go to school during the day. And one night, when he was in the salt mine, he heard these two older gentlemen talking about this place called Hampton Institute in Virginia. And they were talking about it as a place where formerly enslaved Americans could go to school and get an education. Now, Booker had no concept of what higher education was at that time, but what he was hearing from these gentlemen, he thought, Hampton sounded like heaven. And he would do everything in his power so that he could go to that school. He would eventually save enough money and with the help of community, make a 500 mile walk to go to school. Now that walk took a long time. He ran out of money several times. He had to take odd jobs along the way. He slept under bridges, he slept outside. But the point of the story is that there was nothing that was going to get in his way from getting an education. And so when he gets to Hampton, he's torn, he's disheveled, he's dirty, he doesn't probably doesn't smell so great. But he goes right to the headmistress of the school and he said, I want to go to school. And she looked at him and she said, you're not worthy of this institution. Go on off. So the next day he would come back and he would ask her again and she would send him away. And this happened over and over. And then finally, she had enough. She said, okay, Booker, you're driving me crazy. I'm going to give you an opportunity to prove yourself. There's a dirty classroom at the end of the hallway. Why don't you go down there and clean that? Let's see what you can do. Well, he had learned the value of hard work working in those salt and coal mines, and now he could put those skills to test. And he cleaned that room. She came in to do the white glove test looking for dirt. She couldn't find one speck of dust. And so she looked at Booker and she said, okay, you will do for admittance into this institution. Not only that, we're going to give you a job as a janitor so you can work your way through school. He was 16 years old when he started. He would go on to graduate. He would come back later to teach at Hampton. And while he was there as a teacher, he heard about this job for a new school that was being started down in Tuskegee, Alabama. And they needed a new principal. And he took that challenge on. He went down to Tuskegee. And he was looking around for a classroom or a church, an old schoolhouse, somewhere where he could get in his lessons. But there was nothing but dirt, as far as the eyes could see. Didn't stop it. He started to recruit students and he started to get them excited about an education. One of the first things that he taught them how to do was to make bricks. And that's so they could build their own school. And so today, Tuskegee University has educated millions of students and their families. And it's an institution that stands proudly and pristine in the tradition of Booker T. Washington. Now, Booker's philosophy was. You couldn't really start reaching for the higher aims in life until you met your basic needs in life. And for people that had been enslaved, four million people were free, the last of them in 1865, with no plan for emancipation. They had been separated from their families. They were not educated. They didn't own land. All they had was the burlap on their backs. There was no counseling. There was no post-traumatic stress disorder designation. So they were on their own. So Booker understood you had to start with the basics. In some cases, that meant teaching hygiene, teaching them how to brush their teeth, how to tie their shoes. But what he taught them most importantly was he taught them something they could do, a trade, like dressmaking, how to plow the fields, how to be an entrepreneur, a tool so that they could have a stake in the nation's growing economy. But rather than just demanding that the white race change their ways, now, we're coming out of slavery, we're coming out of race, a race-based system of oppression. 
So if you can imagine, look at where we are today in the climate, but imagine back then the attitudes that people would have toward these formerly enslaved people. But he said, rather than demanding that the white race just change their ways, we're going to show free African Americans how they could change themselves, how they could overcome obstacles, develop strength of character, and rise by their own efforts to honorable positions of respect, but most importantly, self-esteem. So Washington was a leader who brought stability in a time of transition from enslavement to freedom, and it may be said that he's the person that bridged the gap between the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation and the Civil Rights Movement. So I've always known that I've descended from these men. I can't really say that there was a time when somebody told me, but I just grew up with their images all around. Can you imagine one day starting to notice that your ancestors are on money? They're on stamps? Schools are named for them? Bridges are named for them? Libraries? Everywhere I turned, I was in the long, vast shadow of my ancestors. We've all seen photographs of Frederick Douglass and how stern he looks and how serious he looks. And he did that on purpose. He was strategic. Do you all know that he was the most photographed American of the 19th century? At the age of 22, two years removed from slavery, he understood that this new emerging technology, photography, could help him make his arguments for liberation and equality in the same way his writings and his speeches could. So he was one of the first to understand that you could use imagery to be able to help shape public consciousness and what we would look at today when we talk to young people about social media and technology and Instagram and Twitter. And one kid says to me one day, so Frederick Douglass, he was that much ahead of it. If he had a Twitter account, he'd probably have 10 million followers. He probably would. But he was strategic. And the reason that he looked directly in the camera in his early abolition days is because he said, I never want to give off the impression that I'm a happy, amiable future. <coughs> When you look at me, you're going to see a man, and you're going to see somebody worthy of freedom and citizenship. And so I spent all of my summers in his summer beach house on the Chesapeake Bay in Maryland. It was built as a retirement home for him, and there were two features that he asked for when the house was being built. One, he wanted the house to point in a certain direction, and the second feature was he wanted to sit in the tower at the, at the top of the house because he wanted to look back across the water and on the other side you could see land. And that was the eastern shore of Maryland where he had been born into slavery and where he toiled away in chains. So here was a man at the end of his life that understood that history was important because we need to know where we've come from in order to know where we're headed. And even though he had been born to the worst horrific conditions, he never wanted to forget where he had started. And in that house, there was this larger-than-life portrait of Frederick Douglass at the top of the stairs. And I remember being about five years old and, and walking up those stairs, and I would see him, and I would look at him and think, man, you look mean. <laughs> and I'm glad I didn't know you. And you know what would happen is I would try and sneak past that portrait? His eyes would follow me. <laughs> And by the time I would get down to the hallway, I could feel his steely glare burning like fire on the back of my neck. And I always imagined in my five-year-old boy imagination, this booming baritone voice bellowing down upon my tiny person, and he would say, you will do great things, young man. And that was a lot of pressure. And to be honest with you, I spent most of my life running away from it. I didn't want anything to do with it. The few times I told people of my relationship when I was younger, nobody ever believed me, and I never thought there was a point worth arguing. And so I was decisively disengaged from this. I was happy to be a father, a husband now of 33 years, a businessman. Robert and I met through working in the travel industry, and I was just happy doing that. But it was this man over here, my good friend, who read a National Geographic magazine from 2003. And he handed it to me, and the cover story was 21st Century Slaves. And I looked at that headline, and I reacted the way I think most people do when you hear about the existence of human trafficking in modern day slavery for the first time. And as I researched it and read more articles 
I remember me reading an article in my house. I was in my living room at night, and I was reading about this 12-year-old girl who was forced to be a sex slave in the brothels of Southeast Asia, and she was forced to service men 20 to 25 times a day. And down the hallway, I could hear my girls getting ready for bed. And at the time, my daughters were 12 and 9. So my older daughter was the same age as this child that I'm reading about. And I'm having this hard time wrapping my mind about what I'm reading and what I'm hearing. And then I thought to myself, that's what young girls should be doing. They should be getting tucked safely into their bed, not having to be forced into bed to serve as some sick individual. And when I put the magazine down, and I walked in to say goodnight to my girls, I had this moment where I couldn't look them in the eyes. And I started to think about some things, and, and something that Robert and I have talked about. We, we loved Roots, Alex Haley's Roots. That was the miniseries, the first one, not the, the most recent one, that ABC Network broadcast in the 70s. And that ran for a week, and millions of Americans were glued to their screen every night because it was the first time that we were seeing what slavery really looked like in this country. Not the whitewashed slavery that the power structure had forced it fed to us, or the erasure of Native Americans and African Americans from the freedom narrative, but true slavery. And we talked about this, and we said, you know, when I was watching this, I, I felt like I could be an abolitionist. I would be an abolitionist. I would fight for those that can't fight for themselves and speak for those that can't speak for themselves. But the problem with that thinking is that we could never prove that to ourselves. Because you're talking about crimes of the past. Now, all of a sudden, here we were faced with a present day crime. And we couldn't walk away and not do something about it. And so we started to talk about, you got a platform. That your ancestors have built through struggle and through sacrifice. And we can leverage the historical significance of your ancestry to do something about this. And so we started, as Robert mentioned, along with my mother, the Frederick Douglass Family Foundation, it's now called the Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives. And when we were looking at how we were going to address this, we looked at the legacies of my ancestors and we said, okay, well, on this side we've got Frederick Douglass, the great abolitionist, and on this side we've got Booker T. Washington, the great educator. Aha! Abolition through education. How do we go about unfitting communities to allow slavery to thrive and exist through education? So we started in schools. We didn't know what we were doing when we went into these schools, but we figured, okay, let's call a school's name for Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington, and they won't turn us away. <laughs> so Robert came up with this great idea, we're going to do 30 schools in 30 days. Frederick Douglass Dialogue. Well, there were a lot of those schools, and we wound up doing 45 schools in 30 days. But what we found was once we got into the classroom, and many of the schools were in underserved areas, so we were talking to young kids that were vulnerable. They were vulnerable to being exploited because of poverty. Poverty is a common denominator that makes people vulnerable no matter what your station in life is or how old you are. And so we went in and we just started talking about the history of slavery and talked about the heroes of my ancestors and the heroines and to talk about their struggles and how they overcame struggles. And there was that common theme that it was about education. And so the students were starting to hear that. And then we would ask them to look through the prism of history and that slavery still exists. We call it human trafficking. But when you really boil down the basic elements of historic slavery and contemporary slavery, it's the same. It's about profit. It's about money. It's about exploiting the most vulnerable among us, brutalizing, dehumanizing for money. So there really is no difference. And slavery has exi existed throughout time. It's raged underground, and then it bubbles up 30 years ago. And because in our minds, as Robert said, we think slavery ended because we know that there was a ratification of the 13th Amendment and the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. So slavery is over. Well, we better call it something else. So we'll call it human trafficking. That's a term that we're not really crazy about, but that's the term that, that we use. But we call it what it is, modern-day slavery. And so students were getting information that would help prevent them from becoming victims. They were getting information that empowered them. Frederick Douglass said, it's easier to build strong children than to repair a broken man. So if we're going to get at issues like demand for sex, demand for sex trafficking, men, 
There are great organizations that are doing work on reducing men, or reducing demand with men, but that's trying to repair broken men. Imagine if we can work with young boys at an age when they're forming their identity and their character, who they're going to become, and ask questions like, would you want your mother, your sister, your aunt exploited in the way that you may have the potential to do if you make wrong decisions? And so they started thinking, well, no, I'd rather be part of the solution than a part of the problem. And so long term, this is how we begin to reduce demand. This is a short term solution because we're preventing the victimization from the first place, but it's a long term solution because we're viewing in our young people this idea that slavery still exists, and as they continue their education career and then go on to careers, they have this in their heart, and we don't have to convince them that slavery exists today. One of, the, one of our challenges in going to communities and talking to school administrators and principals and superintendents is they'll say, well, no, slavery doesn't exist in my community. And then we have to go with the statistics and the cases and to convince them. Young people will not have to be convinced because they will grow up knowing that this exists. And then they can use their talent, their passion, and their intellect. So on your programs, you see history, human rights, and the power of one. That is the name of our service learning curriculum. History, human rights, in this case being contemporary forms of slavery, and the power of one. That's service, because what the students did was they would naturally ask, okay, now that we know about this, what can we do about it? And they've gone into their communities, and they've done incredible work. So with that, I'm going to invite Robert back up so we can tell you about what we're doing with the One Million Abolitionist Project and inspiring these people, these kids. You know, it's so interesting that, that word you're talking about, human trafficking, systemic racism, um, and we're doing it in an atmosphere where uh, a guy sat down for the uh, National Anthem, Colin Kaepernick, and more people joined him to protest inequity and justice against African Americans in the States. And now we're debating the uh, how American, how, how American can you be? You know, if you don't stand up to the national anthem, uh, is this who's more American? You know, or, or if you're not patriotic, maybe that go. Um, so, so we started to be American when we pushed aside uh, indigenous populations and or exterminated indigenous populations, and then we enslaved uh, people of African descent for 250 years, and then we said we're going to fix this, and then. We didn't quite fix it, the, the, the systemic racism part of it. And then, uh, because we didn't fix it, there was a reemergence re of slavery. And so he and I uh, left our somewhat lucrative businesses and, and we <laughs> decided to do this to fight human trafficking. And on the last day of January, we sent our, the, uh, the document of our book. Uh, that we're about to publish to the printer. The next day, the first day of February, Donald Trump said, Frederick Douglass is a great guy, and everyone said, what do you guys think about that? <laughs> Frederick Douglass family. And uh, then we did a blog, and the blog got a lot of attention, and NPR called him, and she called us, and then invited us here to talk about human trafficking, systemic racism, and you guys are listening. And um, it, it's sort of, uh, it, not sort of interesting, it's really interesting, I think. And all of this because your father understood all of this, and he understood enough to tell you about these people who, who also understood it.
in prisons about these issues of systemic racism, mass incarceration, human trafficking. So we begin to talk them out. How do we have more real conversations about this rather than distractions? And, and, um, Let me just, I want to tell you a little bit about the book. It, it, the narrative appears exactly as it did in 1845 with an introduction by William Lloyd Garrison and the letter by Wendell Phillips. And it has the, um, the appendix that Frederick Douglass wrote about slave holding religion and the pure, peaceable Christianity of Christ. But we've added some pieces to this that really make it unique and really help it to speak to the challenges that young people face today, the challenges that people face in poor and oppressed communities and communities of color. You all may be familiar with Ryan Stevenson, who is the president and CEO of the Equal Justice Initiative out of Montgomery, Alabama. Um, he is a leading voice around issues of mass incarceration, prison industrial complex, and he's an attorney by trade, and his group works on exonerating people that have been wrongfully convicted on death row or life sentences. And so he's doing some really important work, and his voice is important, and we were able to get him to write the introduction. And in this powerful introduction, he talks about what Frederick Douglass would have been up against as a 27-year-old fugitive, seven years removed from slavery, again, having never spent one day of his life in the classroom, and looking at this institution of slavery, and the challenges that we face today, we look at this, man, how are we going to dismantle some of these systems, these institutions? Imagine looking and where your government says it's legal to own you, but he, along with the other abolitionists, got to work doing that. So Brian talks about that challenge, and then he draws this direct line from slavery to 90 years of Jim Crow, six years of separate but equal, voting rights act, housing discrimination, uh, civil rights act, all the way up to this legal institution of mass incarceration and slavery, which disproportionately affects young men of color, disproportionately affects young African American men. And I just want to read to you before we jump into questions what he writes. Because I think it really sums, sums up the project. Frederick Douglass, how many people know that Frederick Douglass said, agitate, agitate, agitate? I'm very agitated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so Brian writes in the last paragraph, he said, Frederick Douglass wrote that education means emancipation. It means light and liberty. It means the uplifting of the soul of man into the glorious light of truth, the light by which men can only be made free. We're living at a time when we need the glorious light of truth, people who are willing to stand when others say, sit down. We need people committed to equality who will speak when others say, be quiet. It can be difficult to know how to face some of these overwhelming challenges. Let the words and life of Frederick Douglass show you the way. And this is what the project is about. We want to inspire young people in the same way that Frederick Douglass started to think critically about his condition, to think critically about how these systems conspire to oppress us in communities, and to, in the same way, start to ask questions like, why do, is there, are there disparities in health care and education? Why does inequality exist? And all of these questions that I know, because I'm Frederick Douglass' descendant, that that book has inspired many people to effect change. The Library of Congress named the narrative one of the 88 books that shaped America. It's a classic piece of literature that everybody should read. If you haven't read it, though some of you will be taking away a copy, but everybody should read this book because it will change your life. It will impact your life. Questions? Um, my only question would be, first, thank you guys for coming. I enjoyed the presentation. But my question would be, what role did the Bible play in your ancestors' lives, being Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington? Well, Booker T. Washington went to seminary in um, Wayland Seminary in Washington, D.C., and when he started Tuskegee, about a month after he started it in 1881, he started a Bible college. Frederick Douglass, I mentioned, read the Bible when he was still enslaved. And he would ask questions like, why am I a slave? Do you mean for me to be a slave for life? And in the Bible, he found that, that God loved him. He, when he would escape 
at the age of 22, he became a licensed preacher in the AME church. And so he, if you read his writings, he's very prophetic in the way that he writes, and he uses a lot of um, religious language in his speeches. And so it played a very important part of, of both of their lives. And then the other thing was that when Frederick was enslaved, he taught Bible class in secret which was something that you could really be punished for if you were caught doing that. So it played an important role in both of my ancestors' lives. Did he ever identify himself as like an Israelite? As a what? As like an Israelite. Did he identify himself as an Israelite? I don't believe so. Um, that might be a question for one of the history professors that may have studied that. I, I, in my research and what has been passed down, I don't believe so. But he was a prophetic voice. And we have in our tradition, in African tradition, prophetic voices that are not necessarily taught about in school. So I think if you were to, have you read much of Frederick Douglass? Not him, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. Yeah. Now I'm going to read that. Well, Frederick Douglass was the father of the civil rights movement. So before Martin Luther King Jr. and Rose Parks and Malcolm X and the other great leaders of the civil rights movement, Frederick Douglass was the one that started it all. I knew about him, but not an expert. Well, hopefully you walk away with the book. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, I'm just curious on uh, if we understand that uh, slavery, both contemporary and historic, is based on this idea of making money off exploitation of uh, children as well as African Americans. Um, would it say like the medium of television movies, i.e. Taken or Roots or anything like Django and Chain, would that necessarily be um, positive or negative in that aspect of the mind of Frederick Douglass, considering the idea that by default it is for money making purposes, considering their business, but at the same time it's gaining the conversation out there. Do you, how would you feel necessarily like where the role of television movies as a engage uh, engager of uh, uh, conversation being portrayed? That's a great question. Yeah, that is a great question. And uh, you know, I think if you ask um, if, if you ask people in the anti-trafficking world uh, whether Taken was a good thing or not, I think most would say that it was a positive thing to raise awareness about the issue of human trafficking. If you were to ask Frederick Douglass uh, about how the media represents uh, the issue of contemporary slavery, uh, Frederick Douglass was concerned with the truth, I think. And um, I think this, this is my opinion. Uh, when you see these shows on cable television, MSNBC is one of them that I can cite about uh, sex trafficking. I think it's a further exploitation of those people, and they're exploiting the issue for ratings. Um, so uh, I think the media has can, can play a positive role or a negative role, and I, I think in the case of human trafficking, I'm, I'm still kind of waiting for those positive uh, roles to come out, and uh, it's just not, it's not as exciting to talk about uh, education and to talk about the things that really matter. So let's talk about the sexy parts of sex trafficking. Yes. Um, thank you again. Um, so I was wondering, considering the significance of the city of Rochester to Frederick's life, and as being a graduate of the Rochester City School District myself, have you visited any of the schools and what kind of impact you think it had on them? Yeah, we have visited um, a few schools in Rochester over the years. And as you know, I'm sure you all know, Frederick Douglass Rochester was his adopted hometown. It's where after he broke from Garrison, and he went to Europe and then came back. It's where he started the North Star newspaper and where he did most of his abolitionist work, his important work. It's also where he's buried in Mount Hope Cemetery. So we have done uh, some work in schools. This particular project, we're here 
and we had a meeting this morning to figure out how we could do more work in the schools. We did have a donor, a funder step up and fund 1,000 books for the city of Rochester, and we have not um, figured out where those books are going yet, so if you all have any ideas, um, an organization like a Boys and Girls Club, um, a school, the target range again is 12 to 18 years old, so any organization, it could be a youth correctional facility, that serves the youth population would benefit from Frederick Douglass' words and benefit from his stories, we could use their help. As I said, we can't do this on our own. Each of these books, and, and we did a hardcover on purpose because for many of the kids that we've given this book to, it's the first book in what we hope will become their library. We also have those same people that have pinched my cheek and cried tell me that they've kept this book in their library for 25, not this one, but the narrative, for 25, 30 years. So we wanted to make sure that we were giving away something that the students would cherish. And as Robert wrote, he's the editor of the book, and as he wrote in his editorial note, he said, we want you to take, we want young people, we want you to take this book everywhere you go. Tell them you know who Frederick Douglass was. Quote from the book and tell somebody. And if you want to, if you wear the book out, we'll send you another copy. Or if you want to give it to somebody, give it to somebody and we'll send you another copy. But carry it with you everywhere in the same way that Martin Luther King carried in his briefcase everywhere he went, Howard Thurman's book, Jesus and the Disinherited. We want, the, we know that there are Frederick Douglass out there, and Susan B. Anthony's, and Sojourner Truths, and Harriet Tubman's. Pick your free, Cesar Chavez, pick your freedom fighter of choice. They're out there. And so when this book hits their hands, we know that we're going to inspire them. So we, we need your help. Um, if you have any ideas for the project, if you have the wherewithal to fund some books, 100 books here, 500 there, and at $4 a copy, it's going to impact the lives of a lot of young people. Or if you want to help us fundraise. Question. Yes. Where, where can we get a copy of the book? I, we're going to, um, as Ken said, we've got copies here tonight. But um, if you say we, as in the bigger sphere of we's, um, uh, it will be available on Amazon soon. Coming Christmas. to Amazon to you. Christmas. 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 Before Christmas. Uh, we're going to make sure we're all ready for uh, the holidays and for the bicentennial, which happens this February. Question. Thank you again for coming tonight. Um, real quick, I wanted to ask, you mentioned how the concept of sex slavery, slavery and human trafficking came up kind of out of nowhere for you guys. I was wondering how you kind of contextualized and conceptualized slavery in between the time that we supposedly abolished it here and between the time that we started talking about human trafficking. Well, it's never really exists. Hey, it's never really disappeared. Um, uh, we were having a conversation tonight in the precursor to, uh, uh, as Pam mentioned, the prison industrial system. Uh, it complex the uh, mass issue of mass incarceration. What it really is is a um, exploitation of people who have been convicted of a crime. Well, uh, the convict lease system was about uh, shortly after after emancipation. It was about uh, 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 an African American man who may be loitering uh, or who may be across the street in the wrong place. He'll be picked up. Uh, his bail was too much for him to handle. He didn't have that $10 or $20, whatever the bail was. So he can go to prison uh, to, uh, until that cost is worked off. He'll then be leased out to a local plantation, a local mine, uh, uh, some sort of local corporation. And uh, now we are picking up men and women to, in order to sell them uh, and, and, and make money off of their backs, which is a whole lot different than slavery. So we've had slavery, you know, we, we, how long have we had um, uh, uh, more women than men <coughs> being prostituted in our communities? It's something that's been around. Uh, we've decided to place a slightly different frame on it and look at it from the standpoint of someone who's victimized by this. And that's the frame that we we need to understand it from, because uh, it still happens. It's 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 a system. It's a process. It is a process that we can intercept and do something about. Yeah. 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 Y
And so when Frederick Douglass looked at the landscape of, of slavery in the 19th century, he, he put together a strategy that we need to figure out how to change the mindset of the oppressor and those that have been enslaved. And some of you may know Harriet Tubman's favorite a famous quote, I, I saved a thousand slaves, I could have saved a thousand more had they known they were slaves. So today, when we, we think about slavery, and we get the question all the time, well, they're not in chains, they're not in bondage. Well, in the 19th century, they weren't in chains or bondage once they were broken. They, what they were in was mental bondage. So you have somebody like Frederick Douglass who moved around Baltimore, and he was free to to go out and work and to interact with people of the community. But every single day, he faithfully brought his money back to his master because he was in mental bondage. And it took him 20 years to have the courage to run away. So today, through force, fraud, and coercion, people are in mental bondage. Men, women, and children, but mostly women and children. So the work that we're doing, in addition to this project, we're doing a project in California for the whole state with two other nonprofit organizations that are based in California in partnership with the California Attorney General's Office and the California Department of Education, where we're bringing human trafficking training of teachers, educators, other school personnel, and then introducing a prevention curriculum that starts in the fifth grade. Now, we hear a lot of statistics that the age that girls and boys are being forced into prostitution is getting younger and younger. So fifth grade sounds like a, a young age to start. We don't talk about sex trafficking or labor trafficking in fifth grade. We talk about safe spaces and circles and listening to your inner voice, what's a human life worth. And then it continues in seventh grade, and then there's a little bit more of a conversation and an introduction into sex trafficking and labor trafficking. The ninth grade, it's in a sex education class, and that's where the bulk of the information comes in. And then it's in the 11th grade, it's in a US history class. So now we combine the historical context, because bringing in these subjects into the classroom is very sensitive. It's, you're talking about some very prickly edges. So when you wrap it within the context of history, it tends to soften some of those edges. And we've had success getting into the classroom where other organizations that have approached the school and said, hey, can we come in and do a two-hour awareness um, presentation about sex trafficking to your students, they're getting their hand in the, in the face. So wrapping it within the context of history, but having those four years in California, what we're doing is we're institutionalizing the knowledge. It's ongoing. So it's not just a two-hour presentation, but it's information that they're getting. And then most importantly, as a part of it, we're working with stakeholders in the community, service providers, law enforcement, child protective services, district attorney, any entity that needs to be prepared for disclosure in the classroom or in the nurse's office or counselor's office, that community, those stakeholders need to be prepared to respond so that there's a safety net there. And if there's not a safety net, then everything can go wrong. So we're excited about this project. We've also partnered with Sacramento State, their Institute of Research. They're helping us pull the data out of this. And so we're starting to see some numbers come in that really encouraging for us because we're seeing that this type of education can work and unfit communities to allow slavery to exist. I, I just wanted to add one thing, to, a, an assignment for all of us because we're all students. Um, uh, three books are important with your question. Uh, Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow, Douglas Blackman, Slavery by Another Name, and uh, the last one is uh, Stamped from the Beginning. Stamped from the Beginning, Ibram Kendi. I think those are the three most important books in understanding contemporary slavery and in understanding the origins um, and nature of racism. Yes. Um, I just want to thank you all for coming. Um, so mine is more so a comment and a question kind of. Um, so I've been a senior year at the College of Rockport and my freshman year I took a history course. And it wasn't until that course and until this meeting again where I heard someone connect slavery to human trafficking. And that professor is still here at this college, her name is Meredith Roman. And her particular studies is in the land slave trade and all those things. And I was just a freshman in this class 
And now I'm sitting here in front of this presentation, all I can think about is her voice. Constantly, constantly. And um, it's motivating us to really embrace and learn our history. And that's such a, I mean, I was that, I'm baffled. Like that, I, that connection is very, very real. And I feel like it's a way to help students who are here who don't understand how slavery still impacts us today. Because oftentimes I get told that you are in for slavery. How are you affected? You're not, you know, how are you affected by slavery? You aren't a slave. And your mother wasn't a slave. And her mother wasn't a slave, but her mother's mother, mother was. So it was just that that ideology when you said we're only one person away from history, I'm going to be proud. By the way, if I'm a trafficker, if I want to exploit people for a living, baffled is exactly how I want you. That's, that's, that's the state that we want you to be in. Thank you for your comments. And you said something that resonated with me, which is really important. You said we need to know our history, because history lives in each of us. And in learning about your history, and especially for the young people that we come into contact with, and they don't know, they have no con connection to their past. They don't know where they come from. But it's not their fault. When we talk about the legacy of slavery, and, and just think about any um, issue or abuse that's cyclical, um, alcoholism, sexual abuse, um, spousal abuse, and how it takes generations of families to break that cycle. Imagine coming out of slavery and the trauma. Imagine, try to imagine that, and then you're, you're not going to talk about it. You're not going to, you're, you're embarrassed, you're traumatized, you're hurt, you're in pain. You're looking for your families. And so it's no wonder that we, in African-American families, have not talked about it. But in presenting history and presenting projects like this, our young people are starting to understand that they stand on the shoulders of those who came before them, and they walk in their shoes. And they're being empowered. You see them sitting up straighter in their chairs. I had a 10-year-old girl tell me once, I wrote about, about it in the foreword, and she said, Mr. Morris, I want you to know, she was 10 years old, she said, I researched my family tree, and I found that my great, 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 great grandmother, four greats, was born into slavery. She secretly taught herself to read and write, and then she freed herself. And then she went on to become a businesswoman and a philanthropist. She said, do you know what that means? And before I had a chance to answer, she said, it means I have greatness flowing through my veins just like you do. Each and every one of us has greatness flowing through our veins. And we descend from somebody that made a difference. Someone that sacrificed their lives for the freedoms that we enjoy. Sacrificed their lives just so that some of us even have a right to sit in this room and get an education. And so that's why it's important to to know your history and to know where you come from. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, I just really want to thank you for coming to the College at Brockport and delivering the address that you just delivered. Are in the process of delivering. Uh, it is powerful and meaningful, and I'm so glad that our students here at the college have the chance to be exposed to this uh, and exposed to you and these concepts and ideas that are so often segmented and never really uh, put together. But I'd like to ask you this about Frederick Douglass as a journalist. And one of the main issues about journalism is a search for the truth, the empirical truth. Not opinion, but truth, out of fact. Today, we are confronted with this new concept called alternative truth, <laughs> diverse truth. Right? What would Frederick Douglass say about that? You know, I, I think we, we all have to fight untruths in our own lives, first of all, before we fight them uh, in, the, in the general public. Uh, so we try to do the best we can in finding the truth by telling the truth uh, about uh, who we are and where we're supposed to be and how untruths affect others. Um, I'll, I'll let Ken, because Ken is the keeper of all things what Frederick Douglass would say. Nah, nah. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
But all, all we have to do um, to answer that question is look toward his 4th of July speech. What to the slave is your 4th of July, which he delivered in Rochester on July 5th, where he was invited to speak about independence. And he starts by saying, what do you mean to mock me? By asking me to speak today, what does your independence have to do with me and my brethren that are enslaved? And he went on to talk about this country being guilty of sins that would disgrace the nation of savages at this very hour. When we look at what Robert talked about with Colin Kaepernick and the kneeling and how the first thing that the president talks about is how it's un-American. Well, that's nothing new. Frederick Douglass was called un-American for that speech, but now, now we look at it as one of the greatest speeches in American history. So he was on the right side of history, and I think when those that study this history look back, they'll find that some people are on the wrong side of history. So truth, Frederick Douglass spoke truth to power. He was always searching for the truth, and he would never not, he would, he would make sure that he, you, he would hold you accountable to tell the truth. And when President Trump said on February 1st, Frederick Douglass has done an amazing job, I hear more and more, everybody looked to us for a response. And, and Robert wrote a brilliant response because people were waiting all day for us to come out and attack him. But we didn't. We talked about had, had Trump had more time to explain what he meant, he would have said, and then we went along and listed 15 bullet points Frederick Douglass did an amazing job teaching himself how to read and write. Frederick Douglass did an amazing job escaping from slavery. And we turned it into a teachable moment. And then we said, we agree with the president. Because, yes, Frederick Douglass is still with us. His spirit still lives in all of us. Lives in each and every one of us. So we know what Frederick Douglass would have thought if he were here today. Thank you. One more. One okay. last question. Uh, this is something of a comment. Um, and it's going to bring a couple of things together. I was one of the 13 people who is referred to in the program as being hired by Dr. Sid Sinisfet in the summer of 1970. What's your name, sir? Pam O'Brien. I've been a member of the Department of History and been active within the State University of New York since that day. With the moral clarity with which you speak, it is the same moral clarity with which he was familiar. He was an extraordinary person who believed that we have the power to change the world as it was delivered to us and make it a better place for all of us. And the, the, the means through which that was to occur was education. Mm -hmm. And I, I just sitting here and listening, I think he would have appreciated this evening more than any of the others we've had, and they've all been marvelous. So on behalf of my memory of Sid Sinister, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you for, for the very kind comments, and I'd like to think that he is looking down on us, not both my ancestors are, and Everything that we do, we first ask, what would Frederick Douglass do before we decide what we're going to do? <laughs> so, thank you. Yeah, I think that's going to conclude our program. Please join me again in thanking. They're going to, uh, uh, Ken's going to be outside signing books. We have 52 books to give away, so if we could do the students first, that would be wonderful. Thank you very much. <laughs>